It's better than anywhere else in the world. Let's go to our Lord in prayer as we begin this morning. Our Father, we, we bow our hearts and our lives before You. For we need Your wisdom. We need Your, your Spirit to reveal Your truth to us. In this study of faith, I pray that you will help each one of us know that because of trials, those trials are meant to help us and not hurt us, to strengthen us and not soften us. So help us to understand your truth as we continue to walk through this precious book and teach us to walk in your way. But most of all, Help us to be more like you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. As you know, we're in James chapter 1, so don't be surprised that we are still in James chapter 1. But I want to read to you the definition of what the Bible and how the Bible defines faith, and it's found in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1. And I want to cover this because of the, the teaching of James chapter 1, really in verse number 6, because we live in a, an environment that can be very confusing. I don't know if you've ever asked the question, you know, we have, we have one Bible, and there's so many interpretations to that one Bible. And we've talked about that on numerous occasions in our study on Wednesday night especially. But how we interpret the Scripture is important. And I know that you're saying, well, David, how do you know that you're the one that's interpreting right and it's not somebody else? Well, God's Holy Spirit is the one that reveals truth to us, and God's Holy Spirit is one that revealed this truth to me, and I pray that He's revealing that truth to you. And it's confirmed by the agreement of our, of our spirit that we are walking in truth and not in a lie. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, defines faith like this. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So in other words, faith is our assurance. Does that make sense? Faith is our assurance. Or faith is the substance that consists right now of things that we hope for. It's not things that we hope for in the future, but it's things that we hope for right now. So in other words, it's God's promises that provides assurance that right now we can, we can sing, we can, we can pray, we can praise, we can live, we can obey, we can witness, because this hopeful reality, it, it exists in the substance of faith for your life right now. Does that make sense to you? The faith is what gives us the substance to praise Him, the faith to live for Him right now. And I say these things because we've entered this portion of our, our teaching in James chapter 1, verse 6 that deals with asking and receiving anything in faith. People can interpret that in gaboodles of ways. And trust me, they have. Is gaboodle a word? It is been formed, it is, we can put that in law, it has been formed today. And I think that this needs some clarification, especially in the climate that we live today, because there, there is a dangerous faith movement. And I know this has been around a long time, and I know that if you've paid attention to your surroundings in the Christian church, that the faith movement it, it is within the framework of the evangelical Christianity. And why is it that some people do it that way and some people don't? 
Because this movement is part of the charismatic movement and it's called the faith movement. It's been around a long time, but this faith movement, especially when we're, when we're dealing with something like James chapter 1, verse 6, you need to know where you stand. You need to understand where the, where the, where the Bible instructs us about what faith is. Because you can really take this and go in a lot of different directions, and this, if, and whatever direction you take it, it can cause a lot of confusion and a lot of disappointment in the life of a believer. So when we're, when, when, when the faith movement, when the charismatic movement is talking about the power of faith, they're talking about a faith that does not exist. Let me just be very clear on that. Because it's not backed up with Scripture. When people in the faith movement, they talk about the power of faith, they're talking about a personal power that can possess, that can basically create their own reality. So they believe that this power of faith can change the world and literally manufacture their own future. And they literally believe that they can believe things into existence. Name it and claim it. Y'all ever heard of that? All you have to do is just believe this and it will come true. You have enough faith. So what does that do to somebody that truly believes that something is about to happen and change their future and that doesn't come up? come to fruition. What does it do to you? What does it do to your view of God? Do you see how dangerous this is? And I'm going and I'm building this and I want you to understand why I say these things because faith is that's not what faith is. So they literally believe they can believe things into existence. The power of faith can create healing. What happens when you pray for someone and they don't and they're not healed? But you have enough faith, right? Well, maybe it's it didn't happen because you didn't you lacked faith. The power of faith can bring about salvation. The power of faith can take them from poverty to wealth. This power of faith can take them from being a nobody to being a somebody. Manufacturing their future. Conjuring up, just if I have enough faith, I can literally change my entire future. But nothing can be further from the truth. Because that false belief is a, it is a nothing but a trap from Satan. It's a satanic deception. You can't name and claim nothing. You tell me what power you have to change your future. Your faith can change your future. Faith is not a power which you possess to create your own future. Faith is a God-given ability to trust the future that He promised. And nothing more. I don't have power to change my future. My future is in God's hands. I just have to have faith in order to trust that God who is sovereign has the best view and the best, the best desire for my life, the best goals for me, and that I trust Him, whatever that may be, I trust Him with my life in order to live for Him. I don't pray in faith that He will change it for me. Why? Because I can't see the future. I don't know the future. I can't see beyond what the next two minutes is, much less the rest of my life. So why do you think that I'm going to confuse my life with thinking I have a power to change it? I'm not supernatural, and neither are you. But you see where the confusion happens? So with that in mind, 
The real test of our faith is how we handle trouble. Because when trouble comes along by this faith movement, because if that truly existed, I can pray myself out of trouble. I have the power to change my future. I have the power to say, no, I refuse to go in that, and by faith I pray, I name, and I claim it, that it's no longer going to touch me. I'm going to build a hedge of protection around me. What is a hedge going to do? You need a steel wall. You don't need a hedge. You can't change anything. Well, the Bible calls trouble trials. And it's trials that reveal whether your faith is... And remember, this is the God-given ability to trust the future that He promised you. That's what faith is. The God-given ability to trust the future of what He promised you. So trials reveal whether your faith is living or dead, if it's genuine or imitation, if it's saving or non-saving. Do you have enough faith to trust God because you don't have control over changing your destiny. You see how it changes the dynamics? Charismatic movement says, oh no, you can change your future. All you have to do is name and claim it. But reality is, I just have to have enough faith to trust God with my life. Because I can't change it. I'm just asking you, anybody in here, have you ever been able to change the way your future has come before you? As much as I want, I mean, because all that is is just I, I want a life of ease. I just want to, I want to live a life that doesn't hurt. I want to live a life that I can just skate through and I can enter to the gates of heaven and praise Him forever. But that's nowhere in the scriptures that says that that's going to happen. It says by by stripes that we're going to be, we're going to barely enter into the gates of heaven. Why? Because we're going to go through this life that is filled with turmoil and trials and persecutions. How do you think you're going to get out of that? Well, if I have enough power, the power of faith, I can just change my future. Why not everyone change their future? Because it's impossible. And then you have people that, that believe this, and when it doesn't happen, they just fall away. God didn't. And you can fill in the blank. So Christians need to know how to get through those trials and be stronger from those trials. And that's what we're looking at. And James has given us five ways of persevering triumphantly through our trials. The first way we found in verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We have to have a joyful attitude. Why? Because you're not going to change it. You can be miserable in it or you can be joyful in it. Which one would you rather be? You can't manufacture joy, so this joy has to come from a place that you truly trust that God has allowed this to enter into my life, and I have to walk in that. Second way to persevere is to have an understanding mind. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It produces endurance. It's helping you. It's making you stronger. Those that endure to the end shall be saved. Isn't that what the Bible says? I need endurance. I want to make it to the finish line. I don't, I don't want to be toppled off somewhere down, halfway down the, the journey of life. Third way is to have a submissive will. Because remember, the only way out of a trial is through it. We find that in verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Because on the other end, God has a, has a, has a, a work to do in you. And that work is going to be accomplished, no matter what. The fourth way is where we left off last week with having a believing heart. And we only talked about the first part of that, of this perseverance and fourth way of having a believing heart, and it's found in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And he gives bucket loads. Remember that? 
Keith. Bucket loads he gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And that's where we left off. Because when you're going through a trial, you need a special measure of understanding to help you get through that trial. And that's what wisdom is. And the first requirement to gain a believing heart is to have godly understanding. You need to know that God has allowed this and that He's going to give you the strength to get through it. It's not there to hurt you. It's, he's literally focusing His eye on you to make you a better version of yourself. To be more like Jesus. Not better David, but be, to be more like Jesus. So when you're facing times of testing, and whether it's physical, physical or emotional or moral or spiritual, you need and are in desperate need of God's wisdom. Well, wisdom, I gave you the definition to what that is. It's knowledge. Gnosko. It's not just about facts. It's about experiential experience with God, knowing that God is going to, and He has all the power, He has all the ability, but that knowledge and understanding of the promises of God's truth. Do you, do you really believe that God's Word, His promises are for you? Because if you don't think they're for you, then you might as well just shut the door and walk out. God is the only source of that wisdom, so we call out to Him. And that phrase that we talked about last week, let him ask of God, it's an imperative. That's a, it's a, an express, it's a command. So it's not an option that we ask of God, it's a command to ask from God. Why? Because he is your, he's your only option. Because little faith runs to other places. They look to other avenues of ways out, ways of help. Instead of going to God, how often do you go to somewhere else? Because that's what little faith shows. I don't trust God, so I'm going to go another way. And I'm going to just say, I'm guilty. Are you? You enter into a trial, and the first thing you do is, you don't run to God, you run somewhere else. Some people run to a bottle, some people run to a pill, some people run to another person. Some people run to a pastor. Some people, why? Because it's those, those are not sources of wisdom. God is the only source. And I've given you plenty of scriptures to back that statement up. Calling on the Lord is not an option. It's mandatory. So the Lord calls on us to call on Him. And to reinforce the statement that Jesus makes in John chapter 14, verse 13, where he says, And whatever you ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he reinforces it by saying, If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And that's why I talked about this charismatic movement that says you have this power of faith that can change your future. I'm saying to you, when you look at something like that, if you ask anything in my name, you mean it's going to happen? What does that actually mean? Now, the second part of this believing heart. James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith. What is faith? It's believing God's promises. That those are for you. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Ouch. So this word, but, carries a condition, doesn't it? But, just like if, James makes it perfectly clear that the Lord he gives wisdom liberally to those who ask of Him. Isn't that what we understand? We know that God, if I ask for wisdom, God is more than capable and more than desiring to give me all the wisdom that I need. But, 
but he requires the right kind of asking. James 1.6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. So that's the way I have to ask. Now all of us, I would dare to say, have made requests to God. Probably a couple of you have done it this morning. Lord, make me aware that I'm not going to kill my family on the way to church. That's not the right request, I'm just saying. But I would dare to say that most of those requests have been more of a question or a statement to God than a request with assurance. How many of you, when you pray to God, it's more of a, it's more of a question, more of a statement? Hey, would you be willing to, and I know, I know you don't say it like that, but in essence, that's what you mean. You know, I have a, an example I want to give, see if this will help enlighten what I'm in reference to. My junior, my, in my junior year in high school, several business owners from the First Baptist Church where I was attending had donated money towards a, a youth mission trip. Well, in return for that donation, the youth were required to do some work around their businesses. I mean, it's voluntary, but I mean, if when people give money, hey, instead of us paying it back, let us do some work for it. Well, so the youth pastor at that time set up a work day to pay back those generous donations because basically those businessmen paid for all the youth to go on this mission trip. Well, one of the businessmen was Mr. Knight. He owned the Dodge dealership that was in town at that time. Well, my task, my job for that day was to wash some of the vehicles on his lot. Payback time. Well, one of those cars that I washed was a 1986 Dodge Charger. All right, let's put my, let's, now, I'm, I'm past the Dodge thing, so if you drive a Dodge, please don't get me wrong. But to a 16-year-old, a brand spanking new Dodge Charger was pretty sweet. Well, that Dodge Charger might have well have been a Porsche 911 to me. And to top it off, Mr. Knight said, David, you did such a good job today working that I'm going to let you drive that Dodge Charger around town. If, <laughs> here we go, if Berkeley lets you do it. Hello. And there was a dilemma. I knew Berkeley very well. And I knew that he would never let a 16-year-old, newly licensed teenage boy drive a 1986 Dodge Charger around town. But never heard to ask, right? Well, I did. How do you think that went? Anybody? I made my case, and I think I made a pretty strong case. I remember it. I remember that case. But, 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 I made my case with the anticipation of not getting what I asked for. When I asked my dad if I could drive that Dodge Charger in my heart, I knew it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean? Why? Because... I had Gnosko. I knew by fact, in my past, Papa Burke is not going to let me do something that stupid. He's not going to take and allow me to cause damage to a 19... What do you think? You think I'm going to just casually drive a 1986 Dodge Charger around town? No! Let's see what this thing can do, right? That's Gnosko. I knew what I would do and I knew what my dad was going to answer. So not only not, I only knew factually that I would not get what I was asking for, but I knew by experience that Berkeley Steele was going to say, absolutely not. But 
But let him ask in faith with no doubting. How many of you approached God and you're asking him, can I drive that 1986 Dodge Charger? Knowing in your mind, the answer is no. Because we know that factually, God is willing and able to give us anything that we ask of him. He owns all of it, right? But, but is your request backed by genuine trust in God's character, in his purpose, and his promise? Because there's a lot of things we ask for that we know better than to even ask for. Majority of the things we ask for is to get us out of the trouble that we're in. Remove this from me. When in all actuality, the trial that you're walking in is the trial that he's set in your life to change who you are. Well, how do I know that God is willing to give me anything that I ask for? Because the Bible tells me so. Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if this son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give you good things to him who asks? Hmm. Anything. Matthew 21, 21. So Jesus answered and said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, and do not doubt. You will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it will be done. And whatever things, whatever things you ask in prayer and believing, you will receive. Where am I getting it wrong? Where are you getting it wrong? Jesus said it. Philippians 4.19 And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.8 I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. But we're all wanting to drive the 1986 Dodge Charger. And we're afraid our Father's going to say, no. You see, a request that does not take God at His word is presumptuous and it's worthless. But we're asking for the wrong thing. Aren't we? And this is why James goes on to say in verse 6, For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. If you've got an inkling of doubt in your mind before you even go ask of God, don't even ask. Why? Because you doubt anyway. Why are you going to ask God if you doubt what He can do? But we're so timid. Doesn't it say that we're supposed to come into His presence with thanksgiving and praise boldly into His presence? We come boldly because we know that He's not going to zap us dead when we walk there. And we do this because we trust Him. Or do you really? So if you make a request to God and you truly don't believe that He's going to honor that request, then your request is not really a request at all. It's just a statement. It's just a random statement. And it's that type of random statement that shows, among other things, that you're an immature believer. You're like a child. 
like a child tossed by the wind, the Bible says. And this immaturity, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know here, this is why this is such a difficult book. Because this immaturity will also lead to an even more dangerous condition, which we find in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. Where did you hear to and fro from? James chapter 1. Tossed to and fro, and it says, carried away with every wind of doctrine, every charismatic movement, Every time they said, you have the power of faith, you can change your future. As an immature child, you believe it. And what happens? You're tossed to and fro by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. A deceiving lie of Satan himself. And you fall for it. Why? Because you're not grounded and you don't even trust the God that you're praying to. Wow. James just doesn't let up. Do you know why people fall for silly lies? Because they have little or no faith. You know why your prayers aren't being answered? You're not asking the right way. They don't have this God-given ability. The only God-given ability to trust the future that He has promised them. Do you really trust the future that God has promised you? So when God's not trusted, the only course is to go from bad to worse. Why do I say that? God's the only source of wisdom. He's your only source of hope. If you turn anywhere else than Him, guess where you're at? still stuck right in the middle of where He placed you. So isn't the best thing for us to do is to go to Him, continue to seek Him, and Father, just I have a submissive will. I just finished what you started. Because obviously, i got some work to be done. Whatever you see in me, cut it off. Because it's not going to end until it's cut off. Do you think the doctors, when they go in to do surgery on you, they go in there for a heart problem, and they go in there and fix your lung, and then sew you back up and not touch your heart? No, he's going in there to cut, to, to fix the heart. And you say, I want you to sew me up, and I, before you finish, guess what? The heart problem's still there. So a person who has little faith can expect what verse 7 says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Listen, church, you've got to make up your mind who you serve. Sure, we live in 2023. The world has gone astray. It's always gone astray. We're in a mess. The world says go one way. The Bible says no. Stay, stay this way. The Bible's been warning us. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will, your, will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is, follow Him. Which way are you following? We want to have one foot in the door of the world and one foot in the door with Christ? That's not the way it works. You want to know why you're faltering and floundering around in this world? Because you've got one foot in and one foot out. If God is God, serve Him. If Baal is, serve Him. Joshua 24.15 and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's where you have to get. 
And if you've got there, if you're serving Him, if your whole heart belongs to Him, when a trial comes, you say, Father, this is from You. That's why we can have joy. That's what I'm trying to learn here. That's what I'm trying to learn here. But dang, it hurts. Let me give you one last one. Revelation 3.15 I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I could wish that you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I don't want to be there. And how many of us have world church? World church. Which one's better? Which one's offering you contentment and life and joy? If God does serve Him, if the world does serve it, but there's a price to pay for that. So simply put, if you don't make up your mind who you serve, James chapter 1 verse 8 finishes up and he says, you're nothing but double-minded, I'm a double-minded man and you're unstable in all your ways. Not some of them, all of them. You don't know where to turn. You don't know which way to, to serve and who to serve and what's joy and what's not joy. You're just flip-flopping around with no stability. So when a trial comes your way, and it's going to come, you turn to human resources rather than trusting in the Lord for answers. It's what little faith does. And you may not renounce that God is God verbally, but your actions prove itself. Is that who you want to be? You know, we don't have many in this church. Never have. But I pray that the few that we have are stable in all your ways. You know who you serve. I don't care if I have 5,000 people in a congregation. If you're all living for the world, what, what good am I doing? But if i got 25 that are living for Christ, amen. I'm not going to count for anyone else that what they're doing or not doing. You're going to count for you. It's for you and your house. Who do you serve? Is God God? Then serve Him. If He's not, serve the other. See how that goes. And when you come to your senses, come back to us. Well, James later reveals that those that don't just verbally announce that God's not God, but basically you're saying that He's incapable of handling all of their problems. He reveals this later in James chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. It's a sin problem. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He'll lift you up. So no matter how a double-minded person justifies himself, a double-minded person is serving two gods. Who do you serve? That's what it comes down to. Who do you serve and who do you trust? Because Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and this is what I'm going to leave you with, no one can serve two masters. For either he's going to hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you today, you today, decide on who you're going to serve and go all out. If you're not going to serve God, I'm just telling you the best thing for you to do is drop out of church and serve the world with all your heart. But if you're going to serve God, serve Him with all your heart. Because you're doing yourself harm by serving both. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be ugly here, but neither is the Bible. It's very clear. Look, I've got my own issues I have to deal with. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't do it perfectly. And we have to draw the line somewhere. Sometimes it hurts. And I'm going to be quite frank, it's very lonely. 
Who do you serve? Make up your mind, church. We're getting closer. Oh, we're getting closer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us, the love that you've shown us. I pray with these scriptures that have been placed before our hearts and our, our minds that we will decide today, that we will draw that line in the sand. Today, today is the day that we serve you wholeheartedly. Some of us may have been guilty of having a foot in and foot out. But Father, that was yesterday. Today is today. Today is the day of salvation. Make up our minds today. Help us to do that. Help us to see that you are our only source of wisdom. You are our only source of hope. Sink that deep into our hearts and let us make up in our minds what we are called to do. Father, thank you for loving us. Help us to serve you with our whole hearts and bring you honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen.